All right, hello everyone. Um, my name's uh, Mark Price. I work for a company called uh, Elmax Exchange. Um, we've built a low latency um, FX exchange platform. Um, this talk kind of came out of uh, a lot of the work we've done in the last six months or so um, to tune the operating system to uh, achieve as low latency and predictable latency um, as we could. Uh, so I'm just going to take you through that, uh, the learnings that we got from that. I should qualify first off. This is the Linux operating system. Um, the concepts will exist for Windows and OS X, but uh, the names will be different. So um, if you run uh, OS X in production, this may not be that useful for you, but there you go. OK, um, uh, first off, a disclaimer. It's not the operating system's fault that it gets in the way. Um, uh, Linux is a really good uh, general purpose OS. It does a lot of things, but uh, because it has so many target platforms, um, you know, phones, embedded, desktop, laptops, servers, uh, it has to generalize. Um, low latency, uh, what we use it for is a very special use case. So sometimes it's necessary to uh, provide some hints to the operating system uh, for how you want it to act in order to get the results that you need. Yeah, so why should you care about this kind of thing? Uh, it is quite niche. Um, so uh, these techniques are useful in some scenarios. So first off, uh, most applicable to my company are low latency applications uh, where you need very fast uh, and um, consistent response times. And these are typically where uh, your system end-to-end -end response times are under a millisecond. That's the kind of uh, area you want to be in when these, uh, these um, techniques really come into use. Uh, also, if you have very compute-intensive workloads um, and you know that you're going to get benefit from um, just giving as much CPU resource as possible to your programs, or if you have very uh, long-running jobs uh, and you know that making sure that they're always on CPU is going to shave a little bit of time off at the end. <clears throat> so um, when the OS gets in the way, it tends to manifest itself as a system jitter, uh, which is defined by the dictionary as a slight irregular movement, variation, or unsteadiness uh, in an electrical signal or electronic device. Uh, but more um, realistically, what you see is a variation in response time latency. So if your customer is um, making requests to your system, which do or should do the same amount of work from as far as they're concerned, um, they expect to see uh, consistent response times, um, which is you know, fair enough. And if I don't see them, it's kind of a bad customer experience. Um, and so what you'll tend to see in most systems is a long tail in response time. So uh, the vast majority of requests can be serviced um, very quickly um, and in a consistent time, but your worst case is often way out to the end. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that we want to try and minimize uh, with these techniques. So how do you go about dealing with this? Um, first off, the bad news is uh, you have to take care of all the low-hanging fruit. And this is generally going to be uh, a software problem. Um, so if you're uh, on a managed runtime like a JVM, if you have garbage collection, um, you need to deal with that somehow. So uh, a couple of different techniques. You can either go GC-free, so you have to rewrite all your code, use object pooling and that kind of thing, or you can go down the commercial route uh, and pay for a different runtime like Zing, which will uh, just take care of that problem for you. If you have any slow I.O. in your latency-sensitive path, um, you need to either upgrade your hardware or uh, apply caching or uh, change your workflow so that you can do uh, I.O. out of band, essentially, so that it's not going to um, uh, cause you undue latency. And once your response times, uh, when you've made these kind of changes, are down under about the 10 millisecond, millisecond mark, then uh, you can start using these kind of techniques uh, to see what uh, improvements you can make. Uh, and also, you need to make sure your code is running. Uh, sounds obvious, but as we'll see, uh, it may not always be the case. Uh, and first off, before we even start uh, making any of these kind of changes, uh, measurements are really, really important. So um, we need to validate that any changes we're making are having the right effect, um, and especially uh, that changes you apply in one place are the correct changes to make in another place. Um, ideally, you need to have uh, some end-to-end -end tests which um, are going to mimic uh, your whole um, request lifecycle through your system. Uh, using realistic load, so um, at LMAX we record all our inbound production traffic with a network tap and then we're able to replay that back into our performance environment at varying rates and multipliers of load so that we know that we're exercising the code and the hardware and the system uh, in a realistic fashion. So we haven't just kind of created this uh, idealized view of what we think production load is. So that's really important. 
When we are making changes uh, to systemic things, um, it's really important to isolate your changes. You want to do one thing, uh, then run with that for probably the rest of the day. Uh, see how um, that changes uh, the measurements that you've made. Um, because uh, if we start lumping in more than one change and uh, there's a negative effect, then you need to unwind that and do them one at a time anyway to find out and bisect where the problems come from. So if you just do one thing at a time, then you never have to do that unwinding, uh, which is useful. Uh, so, um, before talking about exactly how we uh, minimize system jitter, I'm just going to do a slight refresher on uh, what um, hardware looks like these days. Um, so, and just to define a few terms that we'll talk about. So, the chassis is the um, physical piece of slab of metal that um, you put into a rack in your data center. Um, the chassis will have uh, peripheral devices like um, uh, network cards or disks. Typically, you'll have um, multiple processor sockets on that uh, chassis, and um, each uh, socket is treated as a NUMA node, and it will have a bank of local um, RAM, which are connected by the uh, memory interconnect, so that the, uh, the total memory there is uh, available to all the CPUs, um, but there is kind of a cost for accessing memory on the uh, non-local non NUMA node, uh, hence the name. Uh, so the processor that's plugged into the socket will have uh, a larger L3 cache that might be in the megabytes, and uh, the processor will have multiple physical cores. Each of those physical cores has an L1 and an L2 cache, which are getting smaller as you go up the stack. Um, and running on the physical, physical cores uh, is this construct called a hardware thread or hyperthread. Um, and that's the unit that the operating system can work with. So when you open your system monitor uh, GUI and you see that you've got four CPUs all churning away rendering uh, web pages, uh, it's talking about hyperthreads at that point. And uh, on pretty much almost all modern systems, they will be sharing a physical core and the physical resources associated with that core, namely the uh, L1 and L2 cache. Uh, so hold that in your mind if you can, uh, and we'll uh, refer back to it a bit later. Um, our operating systems are multitasking. Okay, um, we will generally have more tasks than we have a uh, number of hyperthreads or um, you know, units to do some processing. So, you know, if you run PS or look at top or something like that, there's always going to be more things in the list than there are CPUs on your box. So, the OS um, has to share out the hardware resources, namely the um, CPUs, amongst any tasks that have become runnable and need to get CPU time. Uh, so there's a question about how the OS should do this. Um, uh, we probably would like in the perfect world it to be clever and fast, um, but that would kind of imply uh, a lot of knowledge on the operating system's behalf about how you actually want to run your application threads. Um, so FAIR is the, uh, what we end up with. So uh, the default um, scheduler in Linux is the completely FAIR scheduler, so it's even in the name. Um, and uh, this works by maintaining uh, an ordered data structure of uh, tasks per hyperthread. Uh, and I, I quote Q because it's not really a Q, it's I think a, a ordered B plus tree or something. Um, and uh, what happens is when the scheduler runs for a given CPU, it will pick the task from the ordered structure with the lowest runtime. I mean, that happens to be the head. Uh, and it will put that task onto the CPU when it's runnable. After that task comes off the CPU, either because it's uh, used up its um, scheduling quantum or because uh, uh, some, it's called schedule or something else has happened to take it off, the scheduler will update the task runtime and then it will place it back into the data structure and it will, because of the ordered nature of the data structure, find its right place uh, given its runtime so far. Uh, we can use uh, programs uh, like NICE to set the priority of a thread, um, which seems like a great idea if you want to kind of make sure your thread is always uh, going ahead of other stuff. Um, but in CFS, this really is just a hint to the uh, scheduler that says, I'd like you to execute this process for a bit longer when it gets on CPU. Uh, I think in previous schedulers, it actually had some effect on uh, where it was ordered in the queue, but um, now it's just kind of a hint. So it doesn't necessarily do what you would intuitively expect. <laughs> Uh, and uh, tasks are load balanced across all the hyperthreads in the scheduler's scheduling domain. So um, if we have a situation where uh, we have two tasks which become runnable um, in CPU zero's uh, task queue, then the scheduler, when it wakes up, it can uh, schedule one and then see that uh, we've got another runnable thread. It can migrate it to a different CPU's uh, uh, queue. So that in that way, it kind of 
tries to keep everything ticking over nicely and spreading out uh, processes to where there is resource. Right, we're going to talk about uh, an example application um, in order to kind of discuss uh, an optimal use case for reducing system jitter. So what we have here is um, a data source, which might be uh, a network card or something similar, uh, and uh, a thread which is reading from the data source and pushing messages onto a queue. This is a shared memory queue which uh, two other threads read from. So um, as, as uh, entries are added, we have a logic thread which is trying to pull messages down as quickly as possible. It does some stuff in memory. Um, and a journal of thread which, uh, in parallel, is pulling messages off the queue and will uh, write them to a journal um, because we all like determinism and being able to replay things. So uh, this looks like a, uh, a nice, simple view of the world. Um, if we've got a 48 CPU box, surely uh, we're not going to see any system jitter because all we care about are three threads, right? So, uh, whenever I talk about these uh, diagrams, by the way, these are threads. Okay, so something that can become runnable on a CPU. Uh, but um, this is idealism, and as we all know, Idealism and reality are uh, quite far apart from each other. So what's really happening is uh, your wonderful small um, component of a system is actually running within a language runtime. Uh, so in this case, a JVM, um, but it will hold true for other runtimes. And what we have uh, within that runtime are um, other threads of execution. So it might be uh, garbage collection threads. Uh, your application may have other threads. You may have third party libraries which have imported and started up threads. Um, so already the picture is a little bit more muddied than our idealized view, uh, and it gets worse. So um, running on the operating system, uh, this is responsible for you know, effectively giving you an environment to execute your program in. We have other threads which are either other user land processes or um, house housekeeping threads that the operating system will schedule from time to time. So we can see that uh, it's, um, there's some pressure out there. Uh, you're not always going to be able to execute um, the threads that you want because the operating system is trying to juggle everything for you. So uh, this, through these kind of mechanisms does the uh, jitter arise. Um, so if we want to talk about what's our optimal layout um, for minimizing latency, what we want to do is try and optimize for locality. So uh, given our very simple um, application, it's reading from some data source, it's pushing messages into a shared memory queue, and we have a couple of other threads uh, reading from that queue. So ideally, uh, if our data source is a network card, uh, we want to make sure that our processes are running on the same socket and NUMA node as uh, the network card uh, connected via PCI. So uh, in this case, we would put our producer thread uh, on one of the CPUs on socket zero, the first one. Um, now, because we know it's going to be writing into a chunk of memory, the queue, uh, we want to make sure that the other threads which are reading from that queue, and hence chunk of memory, are also in the same NUMA node, because we don't want to pay the cost of going across the memory interconnect here. And if we're lucky and our queue is small enough, it will fit in L3 cache. So we might not even have to go out to main memory to read from the queue, which is the ideal case. So uh, given that we pack everything together, um, one other thing that's uh, worth considering is that um, these hyperthreads are sharing the resources of the physical core. Um, that means that uh, if, your, if your core is advertised at a, a clock rate of 2.4 gigahertz, say, and you have um, two hardware threads which are executing kind of concurrently, the instructions will end up getting interleaved slightly, so you'll get a lower clock rate than that is advertised. Um, you will also um, suffer cache pollution effects whereby um, you know, your uh, program running on hyperthread zero can thrash the cache that's used by uh, hyperthread one. So um, what we do, do for the lowest latency is um, try and make sure that only one process was running per core. And we'll see some ways of doing that um, in a few moments. But really, you're just trying to restrict as much as possible uh, any kind of interference with your threads that you care about. Uh, so our target deployment for our wonderful simple application looks something like this. Um, we're going to uh, deploy our three threads that we care about for minimizing jitter to uh, a hyper thread um, on uh, a distinct core, and we'll make it so that we're not running any other tasks on the uh, sibling hyper thread. So it's come in pairs. Uh, we're going to give the operating system uh, a bunch of other CPUs to do all its housekeeping tasks on, and the, uh, any of the kind of runtime threads will give it a different set of CPUs. So everything is kind of nicely. Um, compartmentalized. Right. 
how do I start? Uh, simple. Um, first off, start with the metal. Um, the, uh, the BIOS settings you get on a server um, will not be configured for maximum performance, probably. Um, most vendors kind of ship them with power saving features enabled because um, uh, for, for large data center usages where you kind of want to do commute, compute on demand, um, it's better for power costs and cooling costs if you throttle down um, you know, various aspects of the system. Um, but that also has uh, an increased effect on system latency and, and jitter. So you need to change the BIOS settings. Um, I could spend the rest of the talk talking about that, so uh, I shan't. Uh, I'll crack on. But this is what we want to do first, because uh, measuring these kind of effects in the software side is a bit harder. So if you know you've got um, maximum performance enabled in your BIOS, you'll be in a good place to start. OK, so um, having sorted out the metal um, and knowing roughly what kind of deployment we want to make for our uh, application threads, we need to discover what's available uh, on the box, because they're all going to differ in terms of their architecture. Um, LS Topo is uh, a very good tool for looking at uh, your hardware. Uh, it's part of a package called HW Lock. Uh, so if you're running Linux, you can go and install that, run LS Topo uh, on your laptop, and it's uh, an enlightening picture. Um, it displays for you the hyperthreads, uh, the physical cores on your machine, uh, the NUMA nodes, uh, and the PCI locality of any devices that you have plugged in. Uh, and it looks something like this. So um, this is a two-socket system from one of our production servers. Um, the uh, top socket has got four network cards and a SCSI device in it, and the bottom socket has got two network cards in it. Uh, and we're going to zoom in a little bit to see um, the uh, cores, uh, because that's kind of what we're more interested in. So zooming in, uh, LS Topo is showing um, hyperthreads. So in the parlance of LS, Pop LS Topo, that's a processing unit. And this is the number that would show up um, on your system resource monitor or something like that, or if you look in proc CPU info. So that would be CPU 24. Um, but we can see that it's actually uh, sharing a physical core, and that's that uh, slightly darker gray square. And then uh, it will show you the caches and their associated sizes. So each physical core here has um, a, a, an L1 cache of 64K, which is split, split between instruction and data, a 256K L2 cache, there's a shared 15 meg cache for all the um, cores at L3. And so hopefully if our data structure fits in there, we'll be uh, very good for memory latency. And um, it shows the NUMA local RAM uh, up at the top, which on this box is 32 gig. So that's like my other diagram, but flipped upside down um, because I did my diagram first. Right. Um, so we know what's available. What we need to do now is reserve it and use it. So. Um, Techniques for doing that, um, ISOL CPUs, uh, we can use to isolate CPU resources. Uh, this is a boot parameter uh, supplied to the kernel. So uh, you can change your grub.conf or, or whatever um, equivalent for your distro. And so we're going to say to the kernel, um, I'm going to isolate from you CPUs uh, 0 to 5 and 10 to 13. And then we can use the task set command to pin our application to uh, a subset of those CPUs. So I'll say, because I'm running a JVM, task set minus C, 10 to 13 Java. And this says, um, for the executable that you're about to execute and any child thread spawned from it, I want you to restrict uh, the, the CPUs they run on to 10 to 13. And then uh, we set the affinity of our hot application threads uh, using the shared set affinity system call. And this is just a standard C call. Uh, if you're in um, a non-C, uh, context, then uh, you'll need to import some kind of library which can make the, uh, the call for you. Uh, there's a bunch of open source libraries that will do that from Java. Uh, so that all sounds um, terrifically easy. So uh, given our um, example deployment, uh, we are using Shed Set Affinity to set our uh, important application threads. The OS will end up running on everything that's not specified by uh, ISOL CPUs. Um, I probably picked the wrong conference to come up with my own disjoint set notation, but there you go. Uh, and uh, task set is used to limit the JVM uh, uh, housekeeping threads and anything else that's spawned to uh, these CPUs over here. So we seem to have uh, achieved our goal, um, which is good. But there is a problem, uh, and that is that uh, we have um, taken uh, these CPUs at the end, 10 to 13, away from the uh, scheduler who has this excellent uh, function of load balancing threads. Uh, so what happens is the, uh, when we use task set and we execute uh, the Java command, 
that executable is executed on CPU 10, and then any child threads which are spawned from them also execute on CPU 10, and there's no scheduler to load balance those across the remaining four CPUs, so you end up with uh, everything running on one CPU, which is fairly disastrous. So uh, it was a good attempt. Uh, it doesn't work, so uh, we'll need to find an alternative. So um, there are many solutions, I'm sure. Uh, the one we uh, ended up plumping for was CPU sets. Um, it gave us the best results. So this is just one way of doing this. Um, CPU sets is a program uh, based on C groups, which is a, a Linux construct for um, kind of carving up resources. Uh, and it allows us to create hierarchical sets of reserved resources. Uh, we can um, reserve CPU, memory. Um, a, C groups can go further into other devices, but I'll leave that for another day. Um, it has uh, some userland tools, which are nice. Um, uh, CSET is the main operator. It comes from the SUSE distro, uh, but you can get it built for um, other Linux distributions. Uh, and it will allow us to um, programmatically do what we were trying to do before um, with uh, ISOL CPUs. So there's a lot of text here, but uh, the CSET set command um, operates on sets. So this says create a set called system uh, with CPUs 6 to 9. And then we uh, use the proc move function to uh, move everything from the root set, which is kind of everything, uh, to the system set. Uh, and uh, there's a few extra flags that you want to add to that if you want to try this out. Uh, minus K moves unbound kernel threads. So there are uh, other threads spawned per CPU by the kernel, which uh, will occasionally do some work. They don't actually have to run there. So um, anything that can be moved, this will shift them. Uh, minus minus threads moves child threads because uh, there's a race condition in that while a process is being moved, it might spawn a child thread, which would end up on the wrong CPU set. And force does force. There's no documentation of what it does, uh, but it doesn't do any harm, so <laughs> switch that one on. Uh, I don't think it does any harm. We'll see. OK, so um, schematically, uh, we have um, the root CPU set, uh, which has CPUs uh, 0 to 13 on this mythical piece of hardware, which doesn't exist anywhere, because no one would choose uh, those numbers. And uh, we've created a system CPU set with CPUs 6 to 9 and shifted uh, all the processes there. So that's kind of doing the same thing as ISOL CPUs did for us. OK. After isolating um, or getting rid of the uh, OS resources, we now want to run our application in, in, in the same way we did before. Uh, but we're going to use C sets again to uh, construct a, a CPU set called app. And uh, the next thing to do is use the um, exec command. And we'll say, I want to execute in the app CPU set uh, this command. And then we're using task set again to restrict the, uh, the sort of parent application to CPUs 10 to 13. And again, using shed set affinity to uh, pin the hot threads to CPUs 1, 3, and 5. So we've gone from having a root CPU set, which contained everything, to the system one, we've shifted stuff there, and we've created uh, an app CPU set where we're going to run our program. And that looks like this. So we're using shed set affinity in the app CPU set. Um, because we're now in control of what's being scheduled in app, we know that nothing else is going to be put on the um, sibling hyper cores, uh, hyper thread, sorry. Um, all the OS stuff runs in slash system. And uh, using task set to restrict um, the runtime and its child threads, everything's going to run um, on those CPUs there. Now, the nice thing about this is because uh, CPU sets is effectively just creating uh, a new scheduling domain for the scheduler to work within, um, we now get proper load balancing across uh, the CPUs at the end there. So um, the whole VM on one CPU problem has gone away, which is good. No more jitter. Um, <coughs> So this is, uh, all this kind of makes intuitive sense, I guess. Like, uh, you know, you're, you're taking your threads that you care about and you're giving them um, as much resource as possible. But being good scientists, we'd want to kind of uh, have some kind of experiment, confirm our findings. Um, and so if, if we'd been doing our measurements end to end, we, I expect that you would see um, a fair bit of improvement after doing this kind of work for your application um, because, uh, you know, th there's going to be a lot less scheduling pressure on them. Uh, but we want to look a little bit deeper uh, just to make sure there's nothing else going on. So uh, at this point, uh, we can turn to uh, one of the Linux tracers called Perth Events. Uh, it's a, a sampling tracer in the Linux kernel, so uh, it, it just kind of uh, it samples events for you when you tell it to. Uh, it can use the static trace points, which are compiled into the kernel source if you build with uh, config debug. Um, and it also has the possibility of um, inserting dynamic trace points into um, libraries, uh, which is pretty cool. 
Uh, it's very low overhead because of its sampling nature, so uh, it's, it's quite good for looking at a system under load uh, and knowing that you're very unlikely to perturb the system and cause some ill effects just by trying to inspect it. It's uh, you know, not Heisenberg or, or the other way around. Um, it's a good starting point for deeping di uh, digging deeper. So because it's a sampler, you don't get everything, but it, over time you can build up a picture of what's going on and it will tend to give you a hint of where you want to go and look next. Uh, once it's installed, perflist will show um, all the available trace points. Uh, it also does hardware counters and hardware events that I'm not going to cover here. Um, and there's uh, lots of different classes of event groups. So there's stuff for networks, stuff for file systems, stuff for the scheduler. Uh, and we're going to be looking at scheduler events. Uh, because we know the scheduler is responsible for moving tasks uh, um, on and off CPU. So we can use that to make sure that uh, our assumptions hold true. So we can ask a CPU what's happening, uh, and uh, the way we're going to do that is by running this command. And this says uh, to perf, I would like you to sample all the tasks which events emitted by the scheduler uh, on CPU 3. So if you remember from our diagram, I think that's the one that has the logic thread on it. Um, so we're hoping that there shouldn't be any task squishing, because uh, that's bad and introduces jitter. Um, once you've uh, captured uh, some data, Perf report uh, is, will take that binary file and render it into human readable format. Uh, and Perf report's really good if you've got multiple different event types, you can use it to kind of drill through um, and it will tell you percentages of what uh, counts of events and things like that. Um, if you just got a single event and you just want to see the stream, Perf script basically just uh, dumps the event trace for you, uh, which is best um, for this case. So. Uh, this is the output from um, trying to record shed, sw shed switch events on that CPU while uh, this application was running. And what we can immediately see is that we've got uh, two processes. Uh, so there is task switching going on. So just looking at what's contained uh, in that event, uh, first off it tells us um, the program that was executing uh, when the scheduler emitted this event. And we've got the PID. This is the timestamp to microsecond precision uh, which are, and I think it's uh, up time in seconds since the debug file system was mounted. So you can work backwards and roughly convert it to wall time, but it's a bit uh, never quite exact. Um, and then this is the event. So we're only recording shed switch events, so this is all we're going to see. And then each um, event kind of has a, a printf format associated with it. So they all have different um, parameters uh, when they print out. So for shed switch events, what we see is that uh, the... Um, the process that was moved off the CPU was uh, this PID um, running with that priority and its state was runnable. So it wasn't ready to yield the processor. It wanted to continue consuming CPU time, but it was kicked off in favor of uh, the KWorker program, uh, which was the thing that was then scheduled on. And uh, we can see from the timestamps, oh, so that was, that was our Java process being kicked off. And then a few um, microseconds later, um, the KWorker thread uh, moves off again and Java is uh, put back onto the CPU. And the delta there is about five microseconds, so not a, not a large amount of time, but you know, it, our process was taken off the CPU, its state had to be saved, um, something else was moved on which could uh, invalidate caches, uh, and then uh, our Java process got back on uh, to continue its work. So it's going to have some kind of effect on um, how, how quickly we can process messages. And, uh, and this bit here um, is telling us that the KWorker thread was in the sleep state when it came off. So what happened, by the looks of it, uh, it was woken up um, and scheduled. Uh, it found that it had no work to do and immediately put itself to sleep. And that sort of cycle took five microseconds. So not a lot in this case. So now we've got some evidence that uh, our world is not the happy place we thought it was. And uh, we've still got contention for CPU resources. So uh, one approach we could take is to try and find out what is this thing doing? Why is it being put onto the CPU? Uh, to do that, um, and because it's good to introduce these things, uh, we could use ftrace, um, which is uh, another um, Linux kernel tracer. This is the function tracer. Um, it uses the same static and dynamic trace points as um, perf events. It has a much higher, it has a higher overhead because uh, it records everything um, into per CPU ring buffers, so it kind of puts that um, responsibility onto your executing program, um, but it captures everything. So if you uh, are more interested, once you've built up a, a kind of a broad picture using perf and you want to actually um, focus on something very specific, ftrace is, is the point where you can start um, recording everything to see what's going on. Uh, and it can provide function graphs of kernel function calls, which is uh, something that's very cool. 
if you like that kind of thing. Um, there's a, uh, the, the thing you'd actually want to install is trace command, um, otherwise it's just echoing uh, values into file systems um, in the debug file system, which is, uh, well, you can crash boxes quite a lot doing that, whereas this at least makes an attempt to um, stop you from shooting yourself in the foot. Right, so uh, we could use this uh, function tracer to have a look at um, what that kworker thread is doing. Okay. And to do that, uh, we'd use trace command record. And this says, I would like you to trace, trace all kernel functions that are being called by the process specified by PID. Now, we know what our kworker thread's PID is, so we can run this, leave it running for you know, however long we need to, um, and then... Um, Control C it, and it will write some data to a binary file locally, uh, whereupon we can use trace command report, which will display the capture trace data in something remotely like human readable format. <clears throat> and that looks like this. So um, what we can see is that the uh, kworker thread um, was executing on CPU3, which is what we expect. We have the same um, microsecond precision timestamps, uh, and uh, it will show us essentially the um, method calls in the kernel source code which are executed. So these uh, function names up here, you can go and have a look in the kernel source code and they exist. Um, and ftrace, the, the, the function graph plugin, uh, will tell you how long a, a sort of a method call of depth one took. So you can see our times there are in the sort of hundreds of nanoseconds or, or tens of nanoseconds. And uh, the other really nice feature is that uh, when it pops out of um, a, a block of code, it will report to you the cumulative time that's spent in a block of code. So this is interesting. We can see that the process one work function, which contained a function called cache reap, and I've uh, elided a load of lines there, took 86 microseconds. So uh, before we saw that it, uh, our process was only switched out for five microseconds, here it was 86, which is somewhat more significant. Now, that's a slightly higher than it would be if we hadn't been tracing, because you're pushing some overhead onto uh, the executing process there. Um, in this case, uh, the cache root function, um, we can't actually defer it. Uh, this is work that is necessary to be done, so um, we'd have to find other ways around uh, uh, this problem. So uh, that's a very brief whistle-stop tour of uh, how to use traces to look for system jitter. <clears throat> so um, when trying to reduce uh, jitter in the Linux OS, there's a, a few good things to look out for. Um, one is the cache reap function, which we've just seen. Uh, that's a property of the slab allocator, um, which has been replaced in more recent kernels with the slub allocator, uh, uh, which doesn't have to um, execute these uh, recurrent jobs per CPU. But when we were doing our end-to-end -end tests and we made a change to the slab allocator, we saw that our mean latency actually crept up a little bit. So uh, it wasn't intuitive, but we found that the slab allocator was fast enough uh, for our use case that it was better to have this periodic interruption, which happens every two seconds or so. So it's an, another good reason for uh, having your end-to-end -end tests, though, and being able to compare these kind of things, because intuitively it should be better if our threads are not being kicked off the CPU. But for whatever reason, slab was a bit faster. Um, the uh, VMstat update function will be executed on every CPU every second. Um, this is uh, something the kernel does to generate stats, so your load averages and things like that. Um, other work queue events. The, the K worker thread is, there's one of them per CPU. They, they're bound kernel threads, you can't move them. And they're sort of a general dumping ground for um, work that needs to be done on the kernel's behalf. So uh, now that we kind of know we're looking at work queues, we could use the perf um, uh, events uh, starting with work queue, and that would allow us to see any other kind of work queue events that are going on there. So we've kind of um, seen that there was a thread which was being executed, we found out what its function is and what it's doing, and then found a class of events which we can trace to see, okay, I now want to see all the kind of um, work that's being queued, and then we can try and research if there's a way to minimize the cost of those. Um, interrupts, uh, whenever uh, a hardware device um, fires an interrupt, that's going to be uh, surfaced on one of the CPUs in your system. Um, it'll be chosen by the driver, uh, probably. Um, you, you can't stop that interrupting your process. So um, this is something that we also want to stop. It's possible to set the affinity of the IRQs um, in the PROC file system. So you can at least, uh, you have to be a bit careful about where you put them, but you can at least try and stop them from firing on the uh, CPUs where you really care about latency. Uh, timer ticks are, um, they're, they're kind of an interrupt as well. Um, you can't move their affinity. They're going to happen. Um, there is uh, um, a, a config setting uh, when you build your kernel 
that says how often you want each CPU to be interrupted. On our server um, machines, it's a thousand times a second. On my laptop, I think it's uh, every four milliseconds. Um, but uh, this is seen as a problem for a long time, so um, there's some work from the real-time patch set uh, merged into the mainline kernel a while ago uh, that does something called tickless mode, where if the scheduler notices that there's only a single runnable thread on your CPU uh, and there's nothing else in the task queue, then it will just turn off ticks for that CPU for a given amount of time. Uh, and using that, um, what we see is that you can then run for several seconds without any kind of interruption on your CPU. Otherwise, you'll be getting, your process will be kicked off by the hardware interrupt a thousand times a second, uh, which isn't ideal. Um, CPU speed. Uh, the, uh, our, our laptops and our servers, again, they're kind of built for trying to minimize uh, power draw and cooling costs. So uh, the default settings for these kind of things will be to scale down CPU speed to try and reduce power draw. There's uh, file systems on modern kernels where you can go and change these kind of things uh, to um, basically turn them up to 11 so that they're always uh, stressing the fan. Uh, so there's just a few things that you're going to come up against. <clears throat> So I've, I've pushed a load of information. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about some numbers now because uh, I'm sure we could all do with a break. Um, so we're going to use interthread latency as a proxy for system jitter. Um, so we're going to, uh, and this is what the uh, example application that I talked about actually does. It, it essentially is passing a message uh, from one thread to another thread, which is busy spinning, trying to wait to receive that message. Um, and if we look at the time taken between the producer and the consumer um, through that queue, uh, that will give us a rough idea of um, uh, the jitter signal within our system. Uh, so if we run it and we record those times over several seconds, we can then kind of build up a distribution of, of uh, what kind of jitter we're getting in our system. Um, and then we can compare the uh, untuned and the tuned system and see, uh, are these techniques any good? Do they actually do anything? <clears throat> so the numbers. Um, these are... Uh, uh, nanosecond values for interthread latency. Um, the untuned system uh, is, is, is actually not that bad on this box, um, but uh, you can see that the, the tuned values um, for the mean um, is about double, and then we just kind of list them for uh, increasing percentiles. But pretty much every case, it's double for the untuned system uh, in the time taken to get between uh, those two threads. And the max here is the same because there was some event on that system that happened to take uh, that hit both those runs. I'm not entirely sure what it was, but um, with the tune system, it should have been a bit lower. So uh, a picture, um, just to show you how that looks. Um, what I don't report is anything past the four nines on those, um, those number charts. So you can see here that the uh, red line is the tuned application, the green line is the untuned application, so it's still interthread latency. Uh, we've got nanoseconds uh, on the y-axis, and then it's log scale for each of the percentiles going out. So you can see they tend to diverge quite rapidly after about the four nines. If you look at that on a log scale, you can see that um, no matter where you take the measurement, you're just about, um, you're always doing better uh, in the tune system. So you're always going to get um, uh, less jitter wherever you are. So this, uh, th these numbers are, are not terribly impressive. You know, we're still talking um, you know, in the... Uh, in the tens, twenties, or hundreds of microseconds. But these tests were run on a 64 CPU box um, that had had all the right BIOS settings put on it and was effectively idle. So uh, it, was, it was running a um, you know, stock Linux where it wasn't really doing much. So there was no scheduling pressure. But in the real world, that's not going to be the case. So um, these kind of techniques are really useful when you have, uh, especially if you have to deal with bursty workloads. So you can imagine you've got um, part of your application which you want to run really fast, but you also have to service bursts of traffic or maybe um, lots of inbound network connections, and your system's behavior might be to spin up a load of threads to deal with those inbound connections, and then suddenly you've got contention for um, your CPU resource and scheduling pressure, which is not evident in the uh, numbers I've shown so far. So if we modify the application so that it spins up a thread per CPU that wakes up every, uh, I don't know, 10 or 30 milliseconds, I think, and does a busy spin for a little while, we're effectively introducing uh, a real workload where we will get scheduling pressure. And there, this method starts to um, come in handy a bit more. So this is a loaded system where we're just effectively, every 30 milliseconds or so, trying to push our important threads off the CPU occasionally. Now, uh, the untuned system, our max latency between two threads goes up to uh, over 800 microseconds. And uh, the four nines is a lot higher as well. Whereas the tuned system is staying pretty much uh, straight down the line, really good latency. And this is because we've... Um, 
all our tunings have effectively reserved the CPU resource that we want, and we know that we're not going to get any spurious um, uh, scheduling pressure that's going to kick us off the CPU. And uh, a bit more instructive there. Um, so we can see the red line is the tune system, untuned after the three nines just uh, goes through the roof. At that point, your users are not having a good day. Uh, so although uh, on a very quiet system, it doesn't look so impressive. If you do this kind of thing, when you've actually got some real load, you'll, you'll see a, a much bigger difference there. Right, so in summary. Um, select threads that need access to CPU. Um, if your application has important work that needs to be done and done in a low latency manner, identify what those processes are. Um, take some CPUs from the OS. Uh, hopefully you've got enough CPUs for the threads that you need to be low latency. If you haven't, buy a bigger box or a shard. Um, pin the important threads uh, to those isolated CPUs so that you know you're not going to get any contention. Uh, and don't forget about interrupts, um, which can uh, cause you jitter. There'll be loads more things. I've covered just a few, but it's, a, it's like an endless learning process. Um, and always, always, always test your assumptions. So uh, probably the most important slides are about making sure you can measure it when you're making changes and the tools you can use to check that your assumptions are actually valid and that there's not something else happening on the system that you don't know about. Right. Um, there's, uh, we blog about this kind of stuff at LMAX, so if you're interested in low latency and high-performance stuff, um, there'll be some... Uh, interesting blogs you might like to read. Um, there's a GitHub repo which has the example application and a walkthrough of these kind of techniques so you can try it out, see if it, um, you can get some interesting numbers or if it works for you. And uh, if you want to talk, come and grab me or um, give me a line on Twitter. Thank you very much.